Hi, everyone, and welcome to Teacher Stories. This is your host, Ken Peterman, and today's episode is another in a special series we're running with educators, policymakers, and a whole range of experts on a very important and timely question. And that is, what can schools do to help save our democracy? Thus far, we've posted episodes about character education, civic engagement, restrictions on what teachers can say and do in the classroom. And in the coming weeks, we'll be publishing an interview about the dramatic rise of fake news and misinformation on social media, why these things are also a threat to our democracy and what educators can do about it. Another teacher ep a stories episode will include a guest who argues that teachers can and must in a nonpartisan way uh, discuss current events, politics and controversial issues with their students. And many of you may know that that's becoming increasingly difficult uh, as we heard recently from educators and lawmakers in, in Texas, as more and more states are passing new laws restricting what teachers can talk about with their students. You will find all of those episodes on teacherstories.org and our most uh, podcast platform. Today, my four guests will be talking about another educational reality that poses a particularly dire threat to American democracy. That re reality is the way money and other resources are distributed to public schools. Yeah, I know that sounds like a pretty wonky, kind of an esoteric topic. Before you, but before you hit the stop button, I, I hope you'll stay tuned in because this seemingly dry topic raises some really interesting, if uncomfortable, questions like this one. Do we as a nation really want to give everyone an equal chance to learn? Do we really want to give everyone a shot at participating in the democratic process? Or does it benefit some among us to simply leave school inequities in place? And here's another reason to listen to this episode. My guests will offer solutions towards the end on how to address the problem of these inequities for those who truly care about the future of our democracy. So with that, let me introduce today's guests. First, I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Derek Black, a professor of law at the University of South Carolina. Dr. Black is one of this country's leading civil rights attorneys and a widely recognized expert on education law and school funding. His most recent book published in 2020, just last year, is Schoolhouse Burning, Public Education and the Assault on American Democracy. Derek, welcome to Teacher Stories. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Ken. And our next guest is Preston Green, a professor of educational leadership and law at the University of Connecticut. Dr. Green is also a nationally recognized expert on educational law and has written extensively about school segregation, charter schools, and school funding. Welcome, Dr. Green. Welcome to you, and thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to this. Great. And our third guest is Joshua Starr, former superintendent for the Montgomery County Schools in Maryland and for the school district in Sanford, Connecticut. Before that, Dr. Starr is now the chief executive officer for PDK International, an organization founded in 1906, whose mission has been to ensure that all students have access to a quality education. Welcome, Dr. Starr. Thanks for having me, Ken. Great to see everybody. And, and finally, I'm very excited to introduce our, our fourth guest, Sana Kaloon, and who just graduated from high school last spring in Lexington, Kentucky, and is now a freshman at Harvard University. Sana, the youngest activist and scholar on our show today, has been actively involved in journalism and research related to school funding and racial justice. Welcome, Sana. Thanks so much for having me. Excited to be here. So how was your first week at school? Very hectic, very hectic, but also I can like feel my brain expanding. So I'm having a good time. Uh, that's great. Well, congratulations on uh, starting out and uh, we'll all be eager to see how things go for you and, and uh, whether you stay connected to these issues and, and continue writing and researching um, about them. So I want to ask each of you just to speak briefly about a really fundamental question before we talk about the threat to democracy. And that is, what does it really mean to you to be living 
in a democracy? Uh, and what would life be like if we lost it? Uh, how about uh, Preston, how about if we come to you first? Sure. That's a great question. It's something that I had to really ponder. And I mean, I see that, you know, life in democracy, what the democracy means is an opportunity to have a say in how government is operated, have a say in how it's run and be able to select the people who will do as we ask and what we wish. Um, it would be very frightening if we did not live in such um, you know, such a government. And it really is, in my opinion, under threat right now. I mean, you can see all of the voter suppression activities that are occurring in places like Texas and in Georgia. And it's a rem reminiscent of some of the things that we saw back in really the separate but equal era, um, which was really directed toward Blacks, Black people in particular. But we're, it's really, we're doing it again. And it's, I think it's really being ramped up. So it's a very concerning time. And I'm very concerned. Yeah, thank, thanks for sharing that. Josh, how about, how about from your perspective, what, what does it mean to you to be uh, living in this democracy? Well, I think we're, we're starting to experience what it, see for, you know, for real, what it's like to not live in one. Um, and at its most basic to me, it means that everybody has equal access to voting, right? And everybody has an equal, every, every person in the democracy has has a vote, right? Get, gets a say, and the, and each of those is considered equal. That's in the ideal form, which we, of course we've never lived up to, and it plays out as we'll talk about at the local level very differently. Um, but that, in, to, to my mind, that that's the ideal um, of, of what it means to be in a democracy. There, yeah, everybody yeah. has has one vote, and they're equal. So now, how about you? What what does it mean? Definitely want to echo the fact. You? Definitely want to echo that to me, democracy is all about uh, voices, votes, and everything. But I also really want to highlight the idea that democracy should imply equality and equity. Not only should all votes exist, all votes should be counted equally, and all votes should be prioritized equally, which is, again, a system that we have not ever lived in, but it's something that we aspire to. Uh, thanks for that. Derek, how about, how about you? Are you, you written a book, which we're going to talk about, that has a lot to do with schools and democracy, but just the, the concept of a democracy, what, what does it mean to you? Well, mine's similar to, to what we've heard, but a little bit different. I mean, I think it's actually, I think I would say a democracy means that government is responsible or responsive to its people, which is a little bit distinct from saying that everyone gets to vote. Um, but it's also dangerous because we may have people who have desires that are counter to, to equity. And so I think it's responsive to its people so long as it doesn't cross into anyone else's rights. So the majority can't beat up on a minority. And I frame it that way because regardless of who votes or doesn't vote in America, I think we have a, a serious problem of the folks who are running government aren't responsive to the people. And so there's a disconnect there. So I wanna ask you, Dr. Black, you've written, uh, wrote a book published uh, last year called, as I mentioned before, Schoolhouse Burning, Public Education and the Assault on Democracy. I think what that does is it uh, allows us to begin focusing on the connection between our school systems and the, what democracy means. And, and so that's what your book is about. And I uh, would like you to, to share what the thesis of your book is and what prompted you to write it. Well, I think the simplest version of it is the idea that from the nation's founding, right, we were handing over political power to, to average folks. Well, more, more accurately at that point, landed white men, but that was a much bigger group than previously in history, right? At that moment in time, the whole world is ruled by kings and queens. And so if you're gonna hand over political power to people who are not the elites, um, you know, the, the founders believed that those folks had to be educated. So there's a plan from the, from the nation's founding to make education part of it. Of course, the nation fails in its democratic project and we have slavery and a civil war, but it doubles down on public education uh, again. And of course, then we have reconstruction and failure. But when we try to make a step forward during the civil rights movement, again, it's education, it's a centerpiece of it. And so the overall thesis is that democracy, uh, or rather voting and education go hand in hand in the either the expansion of or the retraction of democracy. And so insofar as our public schools are under assault right now, it's not just an assault 
on schooling, it's an assault on democracy itself. Can democracies really thrive if, uh, if, our, if students in a democracy aren't able to get access to quality education? Well, I mean, I think we have to be, first of all, I'd be careful about saying that education solves all of our ills or simply simply having it makes, makes democracy work well. But I do believe it, it's a predicate, right? That public education is a predicate because ultimately there are some people with or without, without government who could procure education on their own. And there are other folks who are gonna be less fortunate. And if we let them start out at radically different positions in life, then their ability to participate in that democratic process is going to be different. So yeah, I believe that public education, publicly financed equal education is absolutely a predicate to a democracy in which all uh, participate equally. Dr. Green, you want to respond to that question? Can a democracy exist or, or thrive if uh, its educational system isn't serving all of its citizens? What, what is interesting is that our democracy has um, has continued even in, even with the fact that we really have never um, provided um, equal funding um, to you know to various communities. Like I've written a lot with Bruce Baker, you know, Rutgers University, about uh, historic inequities in school funding, and what we have found is that for Black communities and for Black Latino communities, there is just um, consistent systemic inequitable funding. And um, this is, and it has always been. So um, I, you know, I tend to think about these questions more aspirationally. Is that you know, we've had a democracy, but it could be so much better if we find a way to provide resources to these communities in a more consistent way. And, and Josh Starr, let me ask you to to respond to the question: Can democracies really thrive if? Uh, all students aren't getting access to quality education. No, and, and we're witnessing that now, right, in, in a couple of different ways. One certainly is through the funding that Preston speaks about. But, you know, I, I hesitate to bring up history when I'm with professors um, who know much more than I do. But it, I, I think that the first state law was in 1647 in Massachusetts, well, it wasn't a state then, but the Commonwealth of Massachusetts said that. Um, Kids need to start being educated. Uh, people need to be start being educated as a way to um, get them introduced to the laws of society, right? So the idea is you have to be able to read in order to understand the laws and so that you can be in, in, be part of the democracy, right? There's this sort of cycle. And um, so in, in some ways, and I'm sure that can be contested, but in some ways that's kind of the underpinning of, of what you need education for so you can participate in, in civil society. Um, so we see it certainly in the funding that Preston brought up, but we've, we've also seen it in the narrowing of the curriculum and the focus on standardized testing over the last 25 years or so, right? We are not teaching our young people, we are not encouraging them to engage in asking the complex ideas to, um, that, that are necessary when you're living in a pluralist society like we are, right? We, in fact, we diminish that. We, we do not encourage that in other ways. And the people like Sana who may then say, well, wait a second, I'm gonna do it anyway. They end up you know, doing great, but we don't encourage the kind of education that actually gets kids to wrestle with the really complex ideas that we need to confront if we're gonna live in our world. And so there's, there's multiple ways to, to sort of um, squelch the, or squash, whatever word you want to use, the um, democracy through education, but, and, and we just are perfecting them, you know, every day in, in America. So now, uh, what, what in your mind is the connection between the quality of our education, public education system and the health of our democratic system? I think I'd like to echo what Dr. Green said about the fact that our public education systems have never actually fully included every single citizen just because up until recently, our democracy was never for every single person in the US. Um, in terms of, which I believe is very important historical context as we examine our current public school systems issues because they do stem from our, like, like Dr. Green brought up, our funding issues. And then like uh, Josh brought up um, how we teach people, but also just 
how we treat the people in our school systems. I think uh, there is more to be said about the expectations that are held of students. Um, I think that we expect students to spend the majority of their time in schools, but have little to say about their time in schools. I believe that we expect students to come out of schools ready to engage with democracy, but we've never modeled that in our school system. Our school system is probably one of the furthest things I've ever seen from a democracy. So I believe that our public education system is its role in democracy is not just to include every student in America, it's to model the democratic process and give all students, regardless of various demographic factors that have pushed them down historically, an equal voice in their own school and equal agency in their learning process, because that is closer to what we are aspiring to in terms of a democracy. Thanks for, for that, Sana. I want to focus a little bit on, on how the inequities exist. I, is it that some states are, are, are wealthier and they have more money to invest in their schools and that's just the way it is? Or are there inequities within states or even within districts? Um, Dr. Reen, I, I think you've written about this, but maybe you can respond to this question about how these inequities in public education uh, come to be in the first place? Sure, yeah. Um, in the research that we've done and looked at like, sort of like how these inequities occur, we find really three major somewhat wonky factors. So I'll go into some of them in detail. First, of course, is local property taxation. I mean, much of school funding throughout the country is reliant upon local property taxation. And we do realize that poor communities may have may not have the funding capacity of, of more affluent communities. But what, there's, but what people tend not to realize is that for, let's say, Black communities specifically, many of these communities were um, redlined, um, you know, did not, because of redlining and uh, various decisions in the 30s, um, just did not have the capacity to, you know, didn't have the generational wealth that could enable them to raise resources through local property taxation. So that's sort of like baked into the cake of our system. We do have the capacity in our school funding systems though to correct these disparities through state aid. But in our research, we have found that um, most states have not done this. They just have not provided sufficient funding to correct for these issues in local property taxation. And finally, there is some sort of what we call stealth inequity, so stealth inequality. And that is that um, school funding, you know, um, folks get together and make school funding decisions that actually do um, benefit more affluent communities much more than they do um, you know, less, less affluent communities. And it's sometimes just done on purpose. So when you take those three factors together, it's not really surprising that we have um, these sort of systemic inequities throughout our country. Dr. Black, I wanna ask you a question. If you're a student in an under-resourced or poorly resourced school, what's, what's different for you than a student in a well-resourced school? Class size, facility, I would get a long list here, Ken, but you know, cl class size for sure, uh, mm -hmm. teacher turnover for sure, um, experience of the teachers coming through the door, special education resources, uh, I mentioned facilities, transportation, I mean, we just go on and on down the list. In fact, I was teaching um, case this morning, school funding case, and, and this is a little bit older, about 20 years older, but you know, the, the floors were so thin in an Ohio school, the teacher literally stepped through them, right? The, the ceilings were so cracking that the principal would go through in the morning and knock the plaster off of the ceiling so they didn't fall on the children during the day. And, you know, th this sounds like something out of a movie, at, at least to me, um, and hopefully to, to the rest of the folks on here. So there are, there are enormous differences and those all add up. Those all add up into a radically uh, different environment. I've written about the key resource that, that many people don't think of as a resource, which is your peers, right? Um, you know, white, middle-income families, they don't know what those schools look like, right? That what we really have is, is, the, is the crowding and clumping of poor and minority students in, into those buildings um, and depriving them of, of interactions and depriving 
uh, middle income students of interactions as well, but right, we have these, these silos. So they look very different in terms of the people inside of them as well. Can you just speak briefly about the effects of these funding inequities? And if, you're an under, if you are a student in an under-resourced school, what is the impact on student outcomes? Uh, just to point out, there's probably many, but um, does it, how does it make a difference in terms of you know, things like graduation rates and academic achievement? Well, it makes an enormous difference. I mean, the number one factor in terms of, of academic achievement is your individual socioeconomic status. The number two factor is actually the socioeconomic status of the students around you. And the third one would be the teachers that, that you experience. So ultimately, it's about people, right? It's about people, people, and people. And, and it has an enormous impact. And in fact, um, you know, folks have done studies showing, for instance, how you know, a middle-income um, student in a high poverty resource deprived uh, school may perform lower than a low income student in, in a middle income school. So these impacts are, are quite stark in terms of educational outcomes and explain you know, a substantial chunk, of, not all, but a substantial chunk of, of, the, of the achievement gap. Um, Dr. Starr, I wanna to come to you. You were a school administrator, a superintendent in a couple of uh, school districts. I'm wondering if there were some students in your districts that actually um, went to schools that were under-resourced or if there, whether there are students in those districts that had an advantage educationally. And if so, what uh, barriers did you encounter to try to rectify those inequities? Well, so I, I was superintendent of Stanford, Connecticut and Montgomery County, Maryland, two districts that, um, are almost exactly the same demographically. Um, of course, Montgomery County is um, 10 times the size of Stanford, Connecticut. And, and one thing just to back it up a little bit, it's really interesting. So Stanford, about 16,000 kids right now. Um, and because it is, it, 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 the design is that it's its own entity, right? You have people from you have wealthier people from Stanford who say, well, what, they do this in Darien, they do this in New Canaan, they do this in Greenwich, right? Why can't we do this kind of stuff, right? They're comparing themselves externally. A place like Montgomery County, same demographics, but it's a county system, right? The funding um, is you get a much better economy of scale and you're able to, because, you know, we, we have 18 jurisdictions in Montgomery County. If Bethesda or Silver Spring or Germantown or whatever it may be, were each its own entity, you, its own district, you would see the same kind of problems you do in a place like Connecticut, right? Um, so there are sort of design questions, sort of system design questions that are part of state legislation um, uh, or subject to state legislation that can actually rectify some of these funding issues. Um, but to answer the question more specifically, so within districts, uh, and there's actually a great Connecticut example in, in Hartford, right? Like Hartford's a perfect example of a place that has beautiful school buildings to speak to, to um, Derek's point, that many poor kids go to because they are intradistrict magnets and you get kids from outside the Hartford area that go in, they're mixed in with kids from the city and beautiful buildings. Right down the street, you have terrible school buildings that are in the neighborhood schools, right within a district, right? Because of how the state and the district choose to spend the money. Um, in a place like Montgomery County, where it's spread out a little more evenly, you give more resources to the schools that have the most vulnerable kids. So there was a deep commitment to making sure that class sizes in K through three were capped at about, I think we capped at about 20 or so, right? To keep small classes low. Um, and, and you can make system-wide decisions to say, we are going to put more money towards those who need it the most. That's the equity question. Um, the challenge, of, and, and then of course, you wanna make sure that your teachers get more training, you leverage your state and federal dollars more to put more resources in to um, uh, just to increase the kinds of supports um, that the most vulnerable kids get. Um, it, it comes with enormous political challenges when you do that because the powers that be who exercise their political, their political power and their, their entitlement don't often like that unless they're getting something for that, right? Um, and, and that's the challenge that, that school superintendents and school boards have to make when they're actually trying to allocate resources towards the most vulnerable kids, which is just a, a hard thing to do. Mm. 
So now I want to ask you about your your high school experience and living in Lexington. Um, and I'm wondering what you witnessed and whether you actually experienced some of these uh, inequities firsthand or at least uh, saw them and saw the effects that they had on either you or other students in the same school or district. So I experienced them and I studied them. Um, I went to mostly, um, I, I lived in an affluent neighborhood. So all of the schools that I went to were very well resourced, which is something I only learned um, pretty late into my educational career um, when I started to get really into education justice and advocacy. And I would visit different elementary schools and they were so, so different from the elementary school that I went to. And I hadn't had any kind of significant reflection over my elementary school experience up until that point. But I realized that I had a dedicated arts and crafts room, that there was a giant gym with a surround system, that there was a commitment to my own individual learning. And whenever I would go and visit different schools in my own district, um, I would see that uh, the quality of resource allocation would go down as test scores went down, all of which were published online. Um, and of course, Lexington, Kentucky specifically, is more segregated now than it was 100 years ago, which means neighborhood lines and school lines are all very, very starkly drawn which means I would go from one elementary school to another and the entire demographic of the students would change as well as the types of resources that they were getting, which is just another you know, manifestation of structural racism at play. Um, the majority of our black and brown population in Lexington, Kentucky was going to incredibly under-resourced and underperforming schools. Uh Dr. Black, I want to ask you, is, is school funding uh, essentially a zero-sum proposition? In other words, if we, had, if we did the kinds of things that are necessary to make funding more equitable, does it mean that some schools like the ones that Sanat attended in Lexington and in a wealthy neighborhood would lose resources? And in order to make sure that other schools that are under-resourced got theirs and, and how do you convince people, uh, some of those parents or others at that school that they should do that if that in fact is what would need to happen? Well, I mean, I, so I think the, an, the direct answer is no, it, it doesn't have to be a zero sum game. It's ultimately about effort or, or rather responsibility, right? Is the state willing to take responsibility for educating all of its children? What we really have is a system of, of complicated formulas that I won't put folks to sleep with, but complicated formula, formulas that are designed to ensure the state doesn't take responsibility. And not only that, you know, to talk about, you know, some of the communities that might see it as a zero sum game, what it ultimately does is relieve them of worrying about what happens anywhere else. And this is, you can sort of exist as an island unto yourself, where you can sort of generate whatever additional resources are necessary. So I don't think it's a zero sum game. Um, I, you know, I think we see states that, that that are more progressive in their funding formulas. We see ones that are less progressive. We also see ones that put forward a lot of effort to fund education, you know, and to be quite frank, everyone likes to beat up on Mississippi and South Carolina, but if you look at the amount of effort that the state of Mississippi and South Carolina put into financing education relative to the wealth in that state, in those states, it's much higher than Massachusetts and Connecticut and et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, so there are, you mentioned earlier, there's differences between South Carolina's capacities to meet its children's needs versus Connecticut's. But that's, by and large, I would say none of them are trying hard enough, but there are ones who try harder than others. So um, the, the title of your book, as I've mentioned, is uh, it's an assault. Part of the title is that, that the problems in, that we've been discussing here amount to an assault on our democracy, which suggests that it's not an accident, that an assault is something that's perhaps done intentionally. And I wanna go back to one of the uncomfortable questions and pose it to all of you. But um, I, I guess the question is whether there are people that stand, or that benefit from the way things are now and they don't necessarily truly want everyone participating uh, 
in uh, fully in the democracy? And I know that's an uncomfortable question because it, it doesn't uh, speak well of the motivations of some people. And I'm just wondering what your, your thoughts are and whether that is uh, one of the factors that we're contending here and don't often talk about. Well, it, it is. I mean, I'll, I think we have to sort of separate out, though, all the motivations. So, you know, part of what I'm talking about in the book is not a, a, an assault that wants to maintain the status quo. And I think that's, that's quite clear. It's actually an assault that wants to make the status quo even less equitable than what it is. So if you think about some of the, you know, the libertarians and, and sort of the Koch brothers network, they don't want to maintain the status quo. They want to wean the public off of public education, right? So, so you know, if the choice is between what they want and the current status quo, actually, I would prefer the status quo. But then there's another version, which I think you're getting at is, and we've talked about, there, there are no good old days. There are no days in which we had fully adequate and equitably funded schools. And that is the, the aspirational sort of hope we need to get to. And I think there's something to be said about that aspiration because public education is actually the most radical idea in America. Like if you look at our constitution, it says, you know, don't take stuff away without process. Make sure I get an attorney before you lock me up. Make sure I can speak freely. But none of it guarantees anything affirmative. Right. Public education is a singular institution. The state constitution say, you know what? Even if some people don't come to the table with equal resources, we want to move them forward. We want to bring them closer to equality. And, and that's an enormous tension with a private property system that says, let us all go to our separate ways. Just don't have government mess with me. And, and that's what we really have is the Coke network of the world saying, we want to go even further in the direction of all out freedom and each man and woman for himself versus a, a gentler, softer kind of America that includes freedom, but also includes the radical idea of public education. And, and so, you know, I, I hope we can tend towards the more radical idea that, that brings us all to an equal place, not, not the one that leaves us to fend for ourselves. I want to let uh, some of the others, uh, some of the others of you, uh, Josh, looks like you want to respond yeah, to the question. Just, and, and just one second, I just want to mention in a moment, we're going to come to our, our final part of this conversation, which is uh, how can this be fixed? And I, I'm hoping that maybe some of you can point to examples of what's happened in states and school districts and maybe even other countries where people uh, people have come together and, and, and addressed this somewhat successfully. But but uh, Dr. Starr, you wanted to respond to the question. I was just going to jump uh, onto what what Derek said, and is that you know the the challenge is that we see th there's a question before us about whether public education is a private commodity or a public good, um, and it's sort of designed in a big P way as a public good. It should be theoretically, but people see it and they exercise their their power and entitlement as though it's a private commodity, right? That I'm going to move into a community that you know can guarantee my child um, a certain level of, of education that I want for them. Um, and it has always been the great ranking and sorting mechanism for American society, right? That's how we, we've designed it um, so that, that some kids are given opportunities to, to move on um, and some kids aren't. And it doesn't work anymore in, in that way, right? So the, the but there's this, just this inherent challenge and like what, what, what's good for, for the whole, right? What's good for the country? And we have a very difficult time with that in America versus how I, as a consumer of it, with my kids want to make, sh you know, make sure that my kid gets what, what I feel she or he needs. And I think that's where the tension arises in the local school board and state legislature debates. And then of course, the Koch brothers and everything else, um, uh, you know, um, because we, we were unable to resolve those, those tensions or that, that tension. Um, can I weigh in as well on this? Please do. Yeah, I would also, thinking about this positively, I think that there's an opportunity here for, there's interest converge, there's an interest convergence opportunity here, I think, yeah. because I think you do see a lot of, um, like mainstream folks understanding now that you know public education is under attack and that they're also realizing that the public schools do a great deal of good for their communities. And on a, and then you have people in uh, say black communities, uh, communities of color who are very concerned about these attacks on critical, you know, 
these manufactured attacks on critical race theory and the discussion about some of these uncomfortable factors in American democracy. And I think that this is a chance for all these groups to get together to fight for public ed. So I think that, um, you know, that this, is, this, this provides an opportunity for people to understand what's at stake. And if we can get together and, and you know, combine forces, that could do a great deal of good. So I just want to uh, wind up by focusing on what's possible. And if you can, uh, if we can point to situations in school districts or in states, um, even other countries that have come together and successfully addressed this problem and uh, successfully ensured that all students in their state or their school district or their school are getting an adequate education. Um, if we don't do that, I think people might be left with the idea that we've got a terrible problem, we have a threat to our democracy, and it's going to leave people being um, uh, disappointed, frustrated, and, uh, and feeling hopeless. So uh, can each of you point to where the solutions might lie, and perhaps even to some examples where uh, there has been success in doing what you're talking about? So now you want to want to start with a, a real brief answer. Um, a lot of what I've spent my time on doing is integrating youth voice into education, and that is where I believe the answer lies. Um, respectfully, I think the adults have had a good a good time with our education system, um, and I haven't seen a whole lot of progress on this end um, in terms of a top down change. So I am very much uh, pro bottoms up in terms of um, student-led advocacy. And my examples generally just stem from Kentucky because like, uh, like uh, Dr. Black was saying, I mean, we, we work hard in the South for uh, our status to come up a little bit in terms of our education um, standing. So in the, in the organization that I personally work for, I mean, we have worked immensely with our state legislature in terms of reallocating funding that was diverted from our state lottery back into need-based scholarship for Kentucky public schools. Um, we have worked to secure and then re-secure stu student and teacher non-voting member um, seats on our Kentucky Board of Education. Um, and I personally believe that in general, our answer to problems of structural inequity is a kind of from the bottom all the way to the top, just an immense level of grassroots change and advocacy. And that takes so much work, but it is actually very, very effective um, and very doable when there are enough people involved. All right, thanks for sharing that, that really positive note about uh, what's possible uh, having younger people get Active, actively involved in solving this problem as you have been. Um, Derek, how about you? Well, I mean, there's, there's a few pieces of the puzzle and I, and I agree with what was said about one of them, but let me, let me tackle a couple of others. I mean, one is ultimately that our schools can't be segregated. If they're segregated, they, they will not be equal. There, there's too much racism. There's too much self-interest. You know, you go down the list for, for America to, to live up to that. And the fact that you know, a diverse education is better than a non-diverse one. And we have seen that work. I mean, the, yeah, what I always push back against this idea that the desegregation failed, desegregation absolutely did not fail. We stopped desegregating. And those are two different, entirely different things. There was lots of warts and bad parts of it, but, you know, it, it did not fail. And, you know, I think uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, perfect example, the, you know, they passed a non-racial sort of uh, rule that no school shall have more than 40% uh, poverty in any single school. And that was a flat rule. And it worked very well with, with some of the highest achieving low income students in the nation and the most integrated schools in the nation. So, you know, unfortunately, there's been abandonment of that there, but we, we see these things work. We've, we've also seen, you know, school funding work. I mean, North Carolina, you know, wealthier than Kentucky and South Carolina, but about 20 years ago, they were really committed to fully, well, to better funding their public schools and had a really strong teaching force. They had, they had excellent teachers in the state of North Carolina. And then somehow or another after the Obama midterms, uh, 
they started running all their teachers off. Some of them came to South Carolina, but we, we've seen that states can do these things. Thanks, Derek. And Dr. Wien, I'm gonna to come to you and have you share some ideas about what can be done to, to make progress in this area. Sure, um, you can hear me. I think that um, one thing we have to recognize is that, in, and, I, and again, I think a lot about this in terms of funding. And so one thing we have to understand is that some of the you know, low income school districts, um, black and Latino school districts may need more resources than other school districts to provide an equitable education. And according to the Albert Schenker Institute over at Rutgers, when 10 states do provide like progressive funding, that is funding designed to provide these school districts with more funding than other school districts. And then if four, and if four states um, provide, um, actually provide 25% more like in terms of funding to these districts. So, and, there, and these are like focused in terms of like providing funding for um, you know, Title I students or um, you know, urban school districts. So targeted funding to meet these geographic needs or student needs, that's one idea. I think one thing I would also like to see is for the federal government to be much more involved in dealing with school funding disparities. Um, you know, over the years, the Department of Education has talked about becoming more involved in this, and they've never done it. And I know that the Biden administration has has bandied about the idea of addressing the issue of school funding and state decisions and becoming much more involved in that. I really want to see them actually do that. I think that you're going to need to have federal inter more federal intervention to actually spread these ideas nationwide, I believe. Dr. Starr, final thoughts on where we go from yeah, here? The challenge here is that um, We've seen tons of examples in school systems of schools that can that that may have a lot of kids in poverty. Schools that might have all the characteristics of a school that wouldn't do well that actually end up doing well. Um, and the the challenge becomes scaling it. Right? How do you scale that within a district? How do you scale it within a city or whatever it may be? And I'm always looking at some of the practical aspects of that. Um, uh, not necessarily. You know, and, and I agree completely with the president Derek said around funding formulas and all of that. I actually think that there's some state accountability rules that could be changed that currently incentivize short-term gains on test scores rather than the long-term deep work that's required to actually um, make sure that a school knows how to or has the capacity to really invest in kids. We've seen it, it all over the place, right? You, there's there's tons of evidence within schools, there's tons of evidence of schools within systems that scaling it becomes the challenge. Um, we have to look at things like teacher assignments. Do you assign your most effective teachers to your most vulnerable kids and what barriers stand in the way of doing that, right? Um, we have to look at things like wraparound services and do we, do we have incentives for that? Do we fund that? So there are some sort of what I would call kind of the small p policy issues that aren't about integration and integration is very, very important. It's not about funding formulas, so those bigger, hairy ones, but things that are actually within the control of a school board, a superintendent and a union to say, no, we're gonna put our best teachers with the most vulnerable kids. We're gonna have wraparound services for kids, right? You know, whatever, whatever it may be. We're gonna incentivize the kinds of practices that we know from the research actually do help improve achievement. Um, th again, uh, there are state accountability rules that can that can incentivize that and kind of create conditions for those success. Um, and I think we, we need to start there uh, because the literature on effective schools is is pretty deep. Right? We, we know what good schools look like. It's a matter of scaling it. And, and frankly, um, the state accountability rules and district accountability rules um, sometimes fly in the face of what we know actually works for kids. I think with that, I, we've come to the end of our time, and I, I really want to thank all of you, uh, and, and Sana, uh, Kaloon, Derek Black, Preston Green, and Joshua Starr for being part of this podcast series on what schools can do to help save our democracy and, and, and delving into a really complex uh, problem that has a direct effect on the democracy that, uh, that we, I think, hope exists and, and, and flourishes, and, and for offering some ideas about what we can do 
to strengthen our schools and to ensure that all school all students have access to a quality education because in the end our democracy depends on it. Uh, Teacher Story listeners, you'll find this and all of our other episodes in this series about schools and democracy on teacherstories.org and they're available this particular series both in video and audio formats and the audio versions by the way are also available on most podcasting platforms thanks again for listening bye everyone <laughs>